Hello, my name is the Doctor. Are you watching Hadley? Reverse of polarity. I quite like horror movies. Hell, I could practically run a YouTube series about them. I rave about the Universal Monsters a lot, but I don't really talk about their younger brother and spiritual successor, the Hammer horror movies of the 1950s to 70s. To keep it brief, after the Universal Golden Age ended, the horror attention then focused onto that of British movie company Hammer Film Productions, who continued the legacy of monsters, but now with the added bonus of sex, gore and violence. They reused the characters of Dracula and Frankenstein, those being public domain, but now swapped out Lugosi with the equally as respectable Sir Christopher Lee, and swapped Karloff's monster out for a series now focusing on Frankenstein's creator. They swapped Karloff's Frankenstein monster out for a series now focusing on the creator. Yes, I said that right. Fanboys can't shout at me. <laughs> Played by Peter Cushing. Those are the basics. They also had a series of mummy films going on. Uh, Quatermass, that was a Hammer production. And even right up until recently, Woman in Black was made by them. Wait, that was 13 years ago? What the fu- So yeah, Hammer became the new headliner with its different and more modern portrayals of the monsters and really did do for a whole new generation everything that the Universal Monsters did for the previous one. Both series are on par for different reasons, but make no mistake, liking one does not guarantee liking the other. These are different film series, just the spirit continues on. I consider myself a bit of a connoisseur of horror history. Yet yeah, there seems to be a recurring theme here of me discovering something that everyone else already knew about. That's our topic today, as I pseudo-review but mostly just bringing to the spotlight Hammer's 1957 production, The Abominable Snowman, also known as The Abominable Snowman of the Himalayas in the US. This counts as Christmas episode, right? There's snow in it. <laughs> Obviously, this film is in black and white, which isn't something that's typically associated with Hammer horror. Heck, I even introduced them earlier as being the colour, more modern version of Universal. But this was very early on in their monster career, and, and it was also actually Peter Cushing's first film with them. On a technicality, anyway, this one was filmed first, but Dracula was released earlier. Joining him in the cast for this is an actor called Wolf Morris, who plays the Sherpa guide Kunsang, and is actually a bit of a familiar face. You see, he plays the character... Padme, in the Doctor Who episode, you'll never guess, the Abominable Snowman. Of course, obviously, it's different characters, the... Kusan's role being far more similar to the Llama's role in this story, but nice bit of trivia, nonetheless. Realistically, we know why he was cast, and it's because these were both filmed in Lime Grove Studios in London, and there weren't that many non-white actors going around at that time. There are worse ways to handle it. Plot synopsis, courtesy of Wikipedia, this film follows the exploits of the British scientist Dr. John Rolson, Peter Cushing, who joins an American expedition led by glory seeker Tom Fiend, Forrest Tucker, to search the Himalayas for the legendary Yeti. And this is definitely how the film goes, but only at a surface level. Considering Hammer's future infamy for its monsters, I was so taken aback and genuinely shocked when watching this and this is why I wanted to make the video on it not to put too fine a point on it but you never see the yeti but that's not to say it's left ambiguous if they exist or not they definitely do this isn't a Blair Witch Project situation but we only ever see them in brief glances an occasional hand here or the ghostly silhouette on a cave wall and that's because the story of this movie does not belong to the yeti but the human characters in a total subversion of the genre that Hammer itself would later go on to define, this film is fraught with themes of human morality and only uses the Yeti as a framing device for that story. The conflict comes from Cushing and Tucker having two completely opposing views on why these creatures should be exposed to the world. Cushing wanting it to further the scientific community and Tucker wanting it to redeem himself for years of being a con man. Morally, two completely different ends, but despite this, they're still doing the same thing. Is their conflict justified, or are they just two sides of the same coin? Does intention ever really matter? This conflict between science and commercialism increases when one of the creatures is shot and captured by the group, and the film really gets going when the group realise that there are other yeti out there hell-bent on retrieving their companion, and they definitely have the power to do so. Suddenly, members of the expedition have started dying, but weirdly, it's never through the direct fault of the Yeti. 
McNee is injured by a bear trap. And as he's lying in bed trying to recover, he actually sees a Yeti. And it drives him so insane that the first thing he does when he can walk again is commit a liven off the side of a cliff. Kunsan gets traumatised by his death and then flees off into the wilderness. Shelley comes the closest and is actually killed by accident while trying to capture a live Yeti with a net. And let me talk about the film's ending. See, something kind of special happens around the 1 hour 20 mark that honestly felt like a fever dream when I watched it. Bearing in mind it was around 2, 3am and I was decently drunk, so that probably helped. Honestly, the movie had been so and so up until this point, I mean, good performances from Cushing and Tucker and an interesting portrayal of the monster. But it was these last 10 minutes that really got me wanting to write a video about it. Throughout the movie, there's been this slow whittling down of all the other characters until it's just the last two survivors, Cushing and Tucker. And then the film suddenly takes on an almost paranormal attitude. Voices start to occur that only specific characters can hear. Cushing hears a radio broadcast telling them that it's now safe and they can return home. Despite the radio having been destroyed earlier in the film. For Tucker, is the voice of the friend who had died not a few hours ago. It's like a siren call trying to beckon them towards everything that they've ever wanted. It's not made clear whether or not the Yeti are responsible for these visions, but I do definitely think the two are related. My personal takeaway is that the Yeti aren't psychic, but that it was the combined low oxygen, stressful and confusing environment, their big moral dilemma and the stress of losing their crewmates that caused these questionable events towards the end of the film. And that everyone who ventures to these corner of the Himalayas receives this kind of experience, being forced to see their own reflection properly. The Yeti, though shown to be inhumanly strong and powerful, are actually this wise, incredibly peaceful race. And we're introduced to the idea of what if these savage beasts actually have the right idea all along? They haven't survived by chance. They've deliberately stayed out of man's way because they know what we are and they know what we do to things that we don't understand. It's the what if man was the real monster all along trope, but it was done at a time where this was a fresh take. And to be honest, if anyone can do that argument justice, it's Peter Cushing. Buddhism is explored a lot in this movie. It's very reminiscent of the lifestyle the Yeti live, and there's some special kind of connection going on between the Buddhists and the Yeti colony. I don't know if it's disrespectful for them to insinuate that the Yeti inspired the Buddhist religion, but I suppose if you abandon a bit of real-world knowledge that they wouldn't have had in the 50s, it fits quite nicely into the movie. It's no coincidence that everyone that sets out to discover the Yeti either claim they do not exist or do not return, because only the worthy and extremely moral are supposed to survive their encounter with them. After witnessing the Yeti, who are these hulking behemoths, these perfect versions of humanity, and then to be faced with the revelation that mankind is the real monster, that much is true and cannot change. The only thing that you have control over is how you choose to respond to this information. You could deny it, pretend it's different for you, that you're the exception. Or you can acknowledge it. You don't have to be proud of your place in the world, but it's important that you are aware of it. You can be guilty by accident. You can be guilty without being malicious. There's so many things that probably you at home right now are guilty of that you don't even know about. You have to have that self-awareness, the open mind to learn from it. Ignorance is forgivable, but it is inexcusable to remain so once awareness is drawn. And at the end of the film, Cushing returns home in quiet contemplation, saying, as many have done before him, that the Yeti do not exist. The Yeti's existence is a perfect paradox, because the ones that sought them out for monetary gain probably have that askew morals that they end up being driven insane by the encounter. It's the only the pure of heart trope done at its best, where there's just some things that are too good for just anyone to have their hands on. However, people with pure hearts have access to things that more corrupt people can't. It's like how in the first Harry Potter book, when Dumbledore hides the Philosopher's Stone inside the Mirror of Arised, and the only way to get it out is if you are someone who does not intend to use it. 
is like that, but replace the Philosopher's Stone with knowledge of the Yeti. Holy crap, that came out 20 years ago? You do see a Yeti in this movie. It's held out until the very, very end of the movie, and it hits different, okay? They, everything that I have said about the way this movie handles its monsters is dialed up to 10 when you actually physically see the Yeti. Don't look at pictures of it, okay? I know it'd be very easy if you just open another tab and just look for how the Yeti looks in this movie. Don't do it. Watch the film for yourself. I guarantee it'll be worth it. And that's it. I don't know. I just find it so interesting that this early on in its career, we got such an alternate take from the thing that Hammer would later become famous for. Considering what they're about to be remembered for, I find it so intriguing thinking about what their franchises could have been like if this film had been a success. Annoyingly, Curse of Frankenstein came out the same year for it, and this was the underdog. If this had been the popular one, I would have loved to have seen the universe where Hammer makes a series of thought-provoking monster pieces. When you think of dinosaur movies, you think of Jurassic Park. When you think of shark movies, you think of Jaws. But when you think of cryptid movies, the most that you kind of have are Harry and the Hendersons and Loch Ness. And even those are quite niche movies by today's standards. In fact, when I think of Bigfoot movies, the only thing that doesn't come to mind that isn't a low-budget horror fest is Harry and the Hendersons. But I think that's changed now. I think in a fair world, The Abominable Snowman would be seen as the definitive Bigfoot movie. Looking at Rotten Tomatoes' review for the film, I can't help but worry that I'm probably bigging this up to be more than it is. It's on Amazon Prime right now, or it is in the UK. I highly recommend giving it a watch and see for yourself. I know I've probably spoiled it all for you now, but purge your mind of any expectation when you go into it, and I think you'll find yourself quite pleasantly surprised. It's barely an hour and a half long, and that time flies by. Right then. Um, well, thank you very much for watching. <laughs> if you'd be interested in seeing other strange delves into very niche, specific media, please do drop us a subscribe and hit the bell. Leave a comment. It really does help their algorithm out. Yeah, thanks very much for watching. I have been Hadley, and remember, the Yeti do not exist. <laughs>